Hello everyone, back to tuning into today's video. Well, Sunday is rapidly becoming uh, my favourite day at GazWeatherViz.com because it's a day when I do uh, slightly uh, different things. I go off in a bit of a tangent usually on Sundays, have a look at uh, the seasonal morals, for instance, do uh, long range forecasting, have a look at the solar cycles. And uh, I know a lot of you do uh, enjoy, <coughs> excuse me, enjoy the videos on Sunday because. Uh, they're slightly different to what I do through the rest of the week. The uh, rest of the week I just do uh, general weather forecasts. Whereas Sunday, uh, Sundays I like to uh, sort of have a leisurely uh, look through uh, different aspects of the weather and the climate. And today I'm going to talk about the uh, Atlantic uh, Multidecadal Oscillation and its partner, the Pacific uh, Multidecadal Oscillation. The reason I'm doing this is that uh, about a week or so ago, the UK Met Office had a meeting uh, that was uh, highly publicised in press. I'm not sure it was really that. Uh, that unusual for uh, Met Office broadcasters to get together and uh, talk about what's going on with the weather. Um, but anyway, it was highly publicised in the uh, media, and the uh, outcome was that uh, part of the uh, reason for the really cold uh, winters that we've been having and the poor, miserable summers is partly down uh, to a phenomenon called the, uh, multi, uh, the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, uh, the AMO being in its warm phase. And there's a lot of sort of eyebrows raised about this in the uh, media, in the papers, uh, because the UK Met Office suggested that the uh, Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation was likely to stay in its warm phase uh, for at least the next 10 years, and consequently we're likely to be seeing more uh, poor summers um, they didn't say it, but uh, you would assume uh, more cold winters. And sort of there was eyebrows raised about this, about uh, a warm Atlantic being responsible uh, for uh, uh, the cold uh, weather that we've been seeing, or the colder weather uh, that we've been seeing in uh, recent years. But actually, it's a pretty good, I think it's a pretty good uh, thesis from the UK Met Office, and I'm going to explain why. Uh, in a moment. This is all natural sort of cycles, it's nothing to do with climate change, that is something separate. Um, but it's a pretty good thesis and the Atlantic multi Multidecadal Oscillation does uh, alternate on a, around a 30 year cycle and these warm phases do appear to coincide uh, with uh, really uh, much colder weather. We've also got to talk about the Pacific Decadal Oscillation though, because we can't use the AMO without talking about the PDO. The PDO is just as important, if not more important perhaps, uh, certainly in uh, taking the AMO from its warm uh, to its cold phases. The PDO is very important in that, and uh, we'll be able to predict when the AMO is likely to go cold again, uh, actually from uh, when the PDO uh, went cold. So I'm going to talk about all that in a minute. For a go on with that, just want to mention the advertising. There's green keyword ads on all my pages at gasweatherviz.com. Uh, if you write your cursor over those keywords, you will uh, see ads being displayed. If you click through the ad, you click through the word, uh, then you'll go to the advertiser website. And by doing that, you'll be supporting GazWebViz.com. So get clicking, and yes, you'll be supporting uh, GazWebViz by doing that. And thanks very much for doing it. So just going to start off by explaining what the AMO is. First of all, it's a, a cycle of warm to cold to warm to cold, uh, running on basically a 30-year average in the uh, Atlantic. And we're going to start off by looking at, it, at an example of uh, a warm AMO. And a warm AMO is basically... Uh, what I talk about in my NAO forecast, actually it's the tripole, it's the warm, cold, warm band, or basically it's this area of warm water uh, stretching out here. Uh, so this from uh, this sea surface temperature anomaly from um, December 2010, very good example of a warm AMO, the AMO was warm in this month. And that's what it is. It's a warm uh, sort of band of water, a warm area of water through the Atlantic Ocean, stretching from Greenland uh, down to the tropical Atlantic, a very classic warm uh, Atlantic multidecadal oscillation uh, month. That was December uh, 2010. Now, have a look at a cold AMO uh, month, and this is uh, one such month back in 1985, this is August 1985, right in the uh, heart of the last cold uh, cycle of the AMO. And again, we see a complete opposite of what we saw with the warm AMO. This cold AMO is showing that we've got really cold waters there going from Greenland stretching down to the tropical Atlantic, a proper, uh, proper sort of cold Atlantic uh, multidecadal oscillation uh, was going on then in 1985. 
so that's the AMO, warm to uh, cold and cold back to warm again on a 30 year cycle. We'll have a look at the cycles in a moment. I uh, just want to talk about the PDO as well because the PDO um, is just as important as the AMO and again it's the same sort of idea it's a warm uh, to cold to warm to cold uh, cycle in the pacific ocean uh, stretching again on around a 30 uh, something like a 30 uh, year cycle so again we're going to look at the cold pdo first of all see what a cold pdo looks like and it looks like this uh, from 2007 this uh, sea surface temperature anomaly charts from 2007 and again it's this sort of idea but we get this horseshoe shape uh, in the uh, Pacific Ocean, a uh, very classic sort of cold PDO signature uh, that is with the cold water stretching from Alaska and going down in towards uh, the uh, tropical uh, Pacific Ocean. A warm AMO, a warm PDO, I should say, is exactly as we saw with the AMO uh, in that to, instead of having a cold horseshoe shape, we have a warm uh, horseshoe shape, and here it is stretching again from uh, around uh, Canada and Alaska going through to the Pacific, uh, uh, through the uh, Equatorial Pacific. Again, this is very much a warm uh, PDO signature, so uh, that is what a warm PDO looks like. And uh, as I say, that is what a cold PDO looks like. This is what a cold AMO looks like, and this is what a warm uh, AMO uh, looks like. So, got all that sorted out, so we can go on now and have a look at uh, the uh, cycles of the AMO and the PDO. And we're going to start off uh, first of all by having a look at the uh, AMO, and the reason I'm doing that, as I say, but uh, we met office recently was suggesting that some of the uh, miserable summers and cold winters uh, that we've been experiencing may be responsible uh, but or the AMO may be responsible uh, for some of those uh, really poor seasons that we've been uh, enjoying or enduring uh, depending on your point of view so this is the uh, <coughs> this um uh, index is uh, taking us right way back to uh, 1860 in terms of the Atlantic uh, multi-decadal oscillation. And what's interesting is that we do see very much uh, evidence of those uh, prolonged cycles stretching on around a 30 year average. So first of all we've got the warm uh, AMO going on here uh, stretching from around 1860 to say uh, 1900 something like that. We've got the warm uh, AMO cycle going on there. Then from around 1900 to say 1935 something like that perhaps we're in the cold uh, uh, cold cycle of the AMO. So we've got the cold uh, AMO going on in this period. Then we move through to the next warm cycle which is taking us again, somewhere from around 1935 to around 1962 or 1963. Uh, so again we're warm up there. Uh, then the next cold uh, part of the AMO is going uh, on from around the mid 1960s uh, to around the mid 1990s. So again we're cold in this period and then that brings us up to the latest uh, very warm period that we're in with the AMO started around 1995 and it's still going on we're right in the middle of it actually uh, we're going to stretch it out beyond uh, the next sort of 10 years probably um, so yeah we've still got the warm AMO going on there so yeah we've got the warm uh, cold warm cold warm cycle of the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation now the two areas I want you to focus on are particularly these warm areas here, uh, stretching from around 1860 to 1900, because that uh, encompasses some very cold, uh, some very cold winters that, that went on through the 1870s and the 1880s. Um, so we definitely did see a. a uh, coinciding uh, at least uh, of, of really cold winters, miserable summers uh, through this warm period. And um, then of course we get this next warm period which stretches from around uh, the 19, mid 1930s to the early 1960s and again that encompasses some very cold winters uh, through um, particularly the 1940s, the 1950s and the 1960s, of course 1962, 63, 1947, uh, the ferociously cold uh, January's of 1940, 1941, 1942, all coinciding uh, with this particular period here, uh, of this particular warm period here of the uh, Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. 
Now, this isn't to say that uh, when we go in the cold uh, Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, that it, we can't get cold uh, winter, but we certainly can from this period here, from around, uh, say, 1900 to the mid-1930s. There was occasionally some cold winters. And um, particularly, uh, this one is quite interesting. Actually, here, we saw a spike there of the uh, AMO, and that coincides with the winter of uh, 1917, I think, 1916, 1917. That was the one really cold winter in uh, the first 40 years of the uh, 20th century there weren't many really cold winters but that was one uh, and I think it does occur with this spike in the uh, AMO actually uh, through um uh, the winter of 1617. Uh, so that's uh, quite interesting. The winter of 1917 does coincide uh, with that spike in the AMO. But overall, through this period uh, where we've got the cold AMO going on, we don't get many cold winters, to be fair. We get uh, one in the uh, late, a uh, couple in the late, not late 1920s, get that one in 1917. But really, there aren't that many uh, cold winters, certainly not in comparison to this warm period uh, that we get. Uh, through uh, from the uh, mid to late 1930s into the early 1960s. And then, of course, we come to this next cold period in the AMO, which takes us from around the mid-1960s uh, through to the uh, mid-1990s. And, uh, again, we don't have that many uh, cold winters through this, this period, although we do have some. We have more than we have in the earlier cold period, interestingly enough. So we have, uh, for instance, the mid-1980s, 1985, 1986, 1987, did have a run of uh, cold winters. And again, through the uh, late 1970s, so uh, 1979, 1981, yeah, there were cold winters going on in this uh, period. And again, in the late 60s, 1969 uh, was another one that was quite, really quite a cold winter. So this period, which is quite interesting, uh, in this period, uh, we get more cold winters uh, than we do in this period, I think. Uh, but nevertheless, this idea still holds true, which is that when we're in these warmer periods, we do seem to coincide uh, with those much, much colder winters. And I don't think it's a coincidence, but our two coldest winters of the 20th century, 1947 and 62, 63, occurs uh, while we're in this warm AMO period. 62, 63 actually is at the very end of the warm AMO period. Uh, so that's quite interesting. I think that does back up the idea, uh, really, that uh, these cold, certainly the cold winters uh, are associated uh, with uh, these warm AMO periods. I'm not quite so sure about the summers. I'm a little bit uh, dubious, to be honest, about the effect of the AMO on the summer. I think that's possibly more down to the solar activity, uh, would be my suggestion, and losing the sea ice. Uh, I think that's also quite important, the way the sea ice melts away. Um, I think that's perhaps a little bit more important than the AMO for summer, but for, certainly for winter, I think the evidence is very good uh, that the warm AMO does seem to coincide uh, with the uh, with the uh, colder, uh, more block type winters. Now, can we predict when the AMO is going to go cold? Because obviously, from this, we can see that we're very much in the warm AMO period. We're uh, right in the heart of it now, uh, and we'd like to stay that way for. Well, it started in 1995, so the idea is that we're probably going to go on at least to, nine, uh, to 2020, possibly 2025, in this warm AMO period. Can we predict when it's going to go cold, though? And I think for that, we've got to use the Pacific uh, decadal oscillation, because the uh, AMO does, in fact, appear to lag uh, the Pacific, uh, the PDO. So this graph is showing us uh, the warm, cold, warm cycles of the uh, PDO. So again, I'll just quickly highlight the warm uh, PDO is there, stretching uh, somewhere from around uh, 1910 to, say, 1948, something like that. That's the warm period. Uh, it's hard to be exact because we do, in these periods of warm and cold, we do still get cold and warm years. So in this uh, warm area here, we're still getting uh, some cold members around here. Um, we do get some cold years, not as many uh, as the warm years, but nevertheless, PDO does go cold sometimes. And in this cold period, which is stretching from around, uh, say, 1948 to around 1977, uh, in this cold period there, uh, well, then we do get the odd warm spike, and particularly 
see here around the late 1950s into the uh, just into the 1960s we get some warmer uh, PDO years there uh, so it's hard to be exact about, about this but certainly this is the uh, warm sort of cycle of the PDO this is the cold cycle of the PDO and again this is the warm cycle of the PDO up here stretching from around 1977 to around 2000 and uh, seven uh, that's the warm cycle and this is the cold cycle uh, it's just starting here we're in the cold cycle of the PDO now um, and that starts around uh, 2007 so what is uh, apparent with this is that uh, the cold uh, PDO here uh, starts around well let's say it starts around 1948 the warm uh, PDO cycle starts around uh, 1977 uh, the cold PDO starts again around 2007 so it sounds like the idea again means 30 uh, year lag so if we go back to have a look at the AMO uh, well then we do see evidence of the lag because uh, well the cold AMO uh, starts there around 1963 so uh, that's when the cold AMO is starting just there uh, but the, uh, the uh, cold PDO actually started uh, somewhere around here so yeah we are getting a lag there uh, the cold PDO starts there uh, the cold AMO starts there uh, and again it's the same idea uh, for the warm uh, AMO lagging at the PDO because the warm uh, AMO starts here around 1995 somewhere around the mid 1990s uh, but the warm PDO uh, actually starts somewhere around here uh, around late 1970s so there's definitely the idea going on there uh, that the AMO is lagging at the PDO and the AMO is lagging it by something like 15 years I think there's something like a 15 year lag uh, from the PDO changing to the AMO changing so I think the PDO is the driver of all of this really the warming and the cooling of the Pacific. The Pacific is the largest body of water, uh, the largest area really of anything on the earth. It's a huge massive area of ocean and that's the driver I think as the warm uh, and the cold uh, cycles of the PDO gradually uh, impact the rest of the planet and it takes a while to do it then that starts to change the AMO but there's something like that 15 uh, year sort of lag so if we assume that the PDO went cold in 2007 I think that's a pretty safe assumption now uh, the PDO goes cold in 2007 the AMO is likely to uh, start to go cold probably in around 15 years from 2007 that's taking us somewhere to uh, the early uh, to mid 2020s so um, yeah let's say something like 2022 to 2025 that's when we'd like to see the AMO starting to dip back into cold territory so that means we've got a lot of years left uh, actually of this AMO of this warm AMO we've got a we've got a long time left of it um, so the Met Office idea that they were talking about the other week, that we're likely to see more cold summers, uh, we're likely to see, uh, they didn't say it, but we'd like to see more cold winters through this period, it's pretty good. Uh, we've got at least another 10 years of this, I think, uh, this warm AMO uh, left to run. Maybe a little bit more than that, maybe uh, a couple of years after that. So say 10 to 12 years of the warm AMO is uh, left over. Now that's not to say that we won't get any good summers because uh, for instance with last warm AMO period that we was in uh, which again I'll just quickly highlight which takes us from around 1938 say 1962 it's this area uh, here there was a, some good summers mixed in with this 1947 itself was a good summer uh, despite the fact it was a severely cold winter 47 had a good summer uh, 1955 had a really good summer and that's going on around here um, when the AMO is very much peaking up that had a good summer 1950, 1959 had a good summer as well so it by no means uh, means that we're not going to get good summers and actually we could be on uh, we could be in, having a good summer 
this summer 2013 it doesn't rule out uh, the chance of a good summer but what i think it does do it limits the chance of a good summer it makes it less likely and certainly for winter i think it does make the prospects of colder winters much more likely because through that period that last warm amo period as i say we have the ferociously cold winters of the early 40s we have 47 we have uh, the mid 1950s 1955 1954 1955 1956 all cold winters 1958 was a cold winter uh, and of course the daddy of cold winters 1963 is also in there as well now the big unknown with all this the big caveat with all this is uh the solar cycles and of course i've done the solar cycle video already solar activity does seem to coincide with blocking across uh europe particularly eurasia the reasons aren't particularly well understood, but for some reason it seems to have an impact on the jet stream. When we have low solar activity, weak solar activity, not many sunspots going on, it seems to weaken the jet stream. When we've got a lot of solar activity going on, it seems to uh, uh, niggle the jet stream, it enhances the jet stream. And again, I'll just show you this graph, which is comparing the last solar cycle, solar cycle 23, with the current solar cycle, solar cycle 24. And this is the peak of solar cycle 23 uh, going on up here. You can't see it that well because of the colours, but that's the peak of solar cycle 23 up there around the late 90s and the early 2000s. Whereas this is the uh, peak of solar cycle 24. It's... Uh, I think it's peaked actually, I don't think we're going to better this peak that we have at the end of 2011, although we are getting a double peak, I've spoken about this, a double peak in the solar cycle, but this second peak probably won't get us uh, far up uh, this graph as the first peak, so I think we did actually reach solar maximum at the end of 2011. But what's very apparent is whatever happens, whether this is the peak or whether uh, this is going to be the peak, we are not going to get anywhere near uh, solar cycle uh, 23 uh, with um, with this uh, solar cycle 24 and as I say the weaker the solar cycle the greater the chance of uh, blocking reasons aren't particularly well understood um, but the solar cycle has been very weak from uh, solar minimum from the solar minimum of cycle 23 through uh, into the what is now the solar maximum of cycle 24 very weak solar activity that almost certainly is having an impact on the blocking uh, that we've been seeing so once you combine the warm amo which we've already established does coincide with winter blocking certainly possibly summer blocking as well but i'm not quite so convinced about that but certainly winter blocking uh, the amo uh, seemed to coincide if we combine that with uh, the solar cycles, which we know also enhances uh, the risk of blocking, um, particularly in winter, but also perhaps more in summer. I think it's perhaps the case for blocking in summer is stronger with the solar cycles, actually, than it is uh, with the AMO. If we combine the two, then it's hardly a surprise, I don't think, that we've been seeing such block conditions, these severely, uh, severely negative uh, months in terms of the North Atlantic Oscillation with March uh, 2013, December. Um, 2010. It's not a surprise that this is going on, to be honest. And of course, we've got Solar Cycle 24 coming up as well. And this is the last thing I'm going to leave you with because Solar Cycle uh, 25, I should say, Solar Cycle 25 uh, on this graph from what's up with that uh, can be seen. Hang on, I'll just uh, get rid of the camera because it's frozen. Solar Cycle 25 uh, can be seen here. Uh, starting somewhere towards the end of the 2020s and going into the early 2030s. So that solar cycle 25, the prediction of cycle 25, is that it's going to be an exceptionally severe, uh, uh, severely weak solar cycle. It's going to be, if this is right, it's going to be the sort of solar cycle that we saw uh, back in the Maunder minimum period. Actually, there's no solar cycle on this graph uh, going back to 1749, it, that is as weak as the predicted maximum uh, for solar cycle 25. It's quite extraordinary, uh, the prediction there for solar cycle 25. And if you assume that uh, this solar cycle up here is 24, this is the one we're currently in, if you assume that is responsible for, or at least partly responsible with the AMO as well, uh, for some of the blocking that we've been seeing, 
this solar cycle 25 it is going to uh, produce some phenomenal blocking if that's right we are going to see some phenomenally blocked uh, summers and winters and we'll still be in the warm AMO period as well through summer solar cycle 25 actually the AMO is likely to turn from warm to cold uh, through that uh, particular period uh, of that, uh, that solar cycle, through solar cycle 25, through that period, the AMO is likely to turn. But nevertheless, um, that is quite a phenomenal prediction for solar cycle 25. And it's going to combine, if the AMO theory is right, that will combine uh, with the warm AMO uh, to produce the chance of some really exceptionally, I would say exceptionally cold and block winters in the latter half of this decade into the early 2020s, the uh, solar cycles and the AMO are likely to combine to produce some really severely cold uh, winters indeed. Uh, we do need to be prepared for this because even with climate change lifting the temperature up by a degree, a couple of degrees, as we've seen in 2010 and 2013, that doesn't mean that we can't get, if the conditions are right in terms of the blocking, that doesn't mean, just because we've lifted the temperature by a degree or two, doesn't mean we can't get severely cold months. And I reckon we're going to be in for a bad old time of it with the AMO and with the solar cycles as well. And when the AMO goes cold, of course, that should, in theory, limit. Uh, it should limit the blocking uh, to some degree. Certainly in winter, uh, you should start to enhance the westerlies uh, with a cold AMO. But with that sort of cycle, will we? Uh, will we enhance the westerlies? Or will we just uh, get stuck, as we did in the more the minimum, of a run of exceptionally cold weather? It's all very interesting to ponder this, and it raises big questions. I'm sure there'll be a lot of debate about this video, a lot of uh, interest in it. Um, and I've got to say, before I just finish the video, I've got to say a big thank you to uh, my uh, good friend, the uh, forecaster from years ago at, at AccuWeather.com, Joe Versailles, because many of these ideas that I've been presenting in this video in terms of the AMO and the PDO, they were first voice to me, and I've learned all this from Joe Bastardi. And uh, he really knows his stuff in terms of the, uh, cy the cycles of the Pacific and the Atlantic and how they impact whether he knows about it all much more than me. But it's all very interesting to ponder. I hope you found the video interesting uh, for uh, this Sunday. Um, big questions to ponder. I don't necessarily uh, uh, say I've got all the answers to this. But uh, certainly I think we've raised some very interesting questions here about what's likely to be occurring over the uh, next few years and certainly I think that prediction from the UK Met Office that we're likely to be seeing more cold or cool and wet summers and they didn't say it but more cold winters I think it's a good prediction uh, there will be exceptions this summer may be one uh, of course we'll still get the odd milder winter as well uh, but I think overall we're going to look back home say 10-15 years and say that was a pretty good prediction from the guys at uh, the Met Office and the AMO and the solar cycle PDO as well all playing their part. That's it for now. It'll be back to normal tomorrow at gasweathervis.com. Hope you found the video interesting. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.